you uh, are kind of living in the dark if you're not tracking your macronutrients and you're getting unfavorable body composition changes and you're saying, well, I'm eating less calories than I'm burning, but you know, many people doing that are not precisely tracking their macros in any way, or they've cut carbs. Uh, this is what I hear a lot, almost on a daily basis. I get emails from people. Hey, I tried the ketogenic diet. I cut carbs to like less than 20 grams a day and I still kept gaining weight. You know, my response is, okay, have you been tracking your macronutrients and your calories? And the response is like, well, I didn't think you had to do that. Dom, welcome to a whole new level. You're a regular on the show. Really excited. I think this is actually your and my first opportunity to do an episode together, which is um, a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Great to see you again, Josh, and great to be here. Thank you. Well, for those who don't know, uh, Dom Diagostino uh, is an associate professor at the University of South Florida. He teaches students at the Morsani College of Medicine, Department of Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology. A lot of focus on neuropharmacology, medical biochemistry, physiology, neuroscience, and he's also a research scientist at the IHMC, Institute for Human Machine Cognition. Lots of uh, deep, deep experience in metabolic health, and um, he also runs an organization called KetoNutrition.org, which I highly recommend checking out. So with that, we have a lot to talk about today, and I'm also excited to introduce a new feature set that is going to be kind of the foundation for the subject that we'll be talking about today, which is macronutrients. Gigantic topic, but something that a lot of people have heard about, haven't necessarily considered, and or maybe they have been using it for years and, and potentially have not explored the full scope of what macronutrients are and what the macronutrient tracking uh, tools could, could look like. Yeah, I'm very excited. Levels has been working in the space of metabolic health now for about five years, and only recently did we roll out macronutrient tracking. And the reason for that is that we were waiting to develop a set of features that we felt fit seamlessly with the Levels experience, which is you know, goal-oriented around minimal overhead, just being able to, to quickly and almost effortlessly put mile markers throughout your day about what you ate and then how your body responded to that. Now, macronutrient tracking can often be pretty onerous, requires a lot of counting and weighing and uh, portioning. And we wanted to make sure that we could work around that and, and build a set of tools that would streamline this quite a bit. So um, that's my introduction. We've, we've got macro logging now out to both iOS and Android uh, users of levels and um, the features are, are pretty exciting. I'm using them very consistently and I'm really excited really to back up from that rollout and, and talk about the big picture. W what are macronutrients? Why are they relevant? And how are we planning to, to use this information to improve metabolic health? So uh, with that intro, I'd, I'd love to just kind of hear from you, Dom, you know, how would you describe what exactly are macros? And um, for those that are unfamiliar with the term, what are the, the major ones? Yeah. Uh, before I describe them, I'd just like to say that, you know, most people do not engage in the tedious uh, calculation with a gram scale to measure them out and track macros. But uh, just being networked with the fitness community, this is kind of like the thing that they do like on an average <laughs> day. So uh, and also if you really have plans to optimize your metabolic health and also body composition, understanding macros and what you're eating and just doing it for a couple weeks or even doing it for a week or two would be incredibly informative. So, uh, you know, diet composition would, so your macronutrient sort of profile describes your diet composition. The difference in diet composition is actually one of the key sort of focus of the medical education uh, in nutrition that our class is focusing from a very high level. It's probably the most talked about an important thing uh, in nutrition research right now. So you have protein, you have fat, and you have carbohydrates. Uh, a component of carbohydrates is fiber. That could be some consider that a fourth macronutrient. But you're from a very basic level, your protein is made up of is probably the most central macronutrient that you should focus on. So we have essential amino acids um, that comprise protein. Protein is made up of amino acids. Protein provides like the bulk structure of your body, not just skeletal muscle, but also things like your skin and your hair and antibodies and ion channels on cell membranes and enzymes are protein. So all these things can compose 
comprise protein. And if you are deficient in protein, then that could, for example, impact your immune system. So it's really Im important to sort of centralize protein. There are, uh, I think, nine essential amino acids uh, in protein that you have to, uh, if you're following a vegan diet, for example, uh, calculating your protein is super important. And also, also the amino acid composition of that macronutrient is also really important. For example, um, you know, when we discuss different vegetarian or, or especially vegan based diets, you need to sort of formulate it in a way that makes sure there's sufficient amounts of methionine and lysine, especially lysine is deficient in vegan diets and B12 and iron too. So, uh, so protein should really be central. It's, it's hotly debated how much protein we should have. Uh, and that becomes like a whole nother field of research in and of itself, probably one of the more active areas of research. Uh, generally speaking, you know, dietary guidelines, something like 0.6 grams per pound. Uh, but I am of the opinion that that's too low, uh, at the very least 0 0.75 grams per pound, uh, would be, you know, kind of ideal. Uh, and then if you're an active person upwards of one gram per pound, you know, so a 200 pound person, uh, well, I'd kind of correct that to one gram per pound of ideal body weight. So if you're an obese person that's overweight, you don't want to, so you want to, um, do it grams per, uh, pound of ideal body weight would be a good way to go about doing it. So, and protein, there's a lot of discussion about excess protein, you know, associated with aging and inhibiting kidney function and being toxic to the kidneys. So, um, so we can get into that discussion, I think maybe later on, but from a general perspective, you have protein as just, we're discussing macronutrients. We have fat, uh, there are essential fatty acids. There are like four different types of fats, uh, in the diet. There's saturated fat, there's polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs, there's monounsaturated fatty acids or MUFAs, and then there's trans fats, which we should try to minimize. Some trans fats are actually found in nature, but generally speaking, they are sort of synthetic fats that are produced in the factory. And then there's the discussion about, uh, omega sixes, seed oils, and then omega three fatty acids and those ratios. And we could go down sort of the rabbit hole to talk about what are the optimal, uh, fats that we should avoid and, and shouldn't avoid. Uh, but the, the, the next macronutrient would be carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are the only macronutrient that's not essential. Uh, that doesn't mean that leaving carbohydrates out of your diet is optimal. So in many sort of avoiding carbohydrates altogether is probably not optimal with carbohydrates. You have, uh, monosaccharides and disaccharides. You have starches, you have glycogen. You actually eat glycogen if you're like eating liver or muscles and, uh, you know, different types of seafood actually kind of has glycogen. So you need to like calculate that into your carbohydrate allotment and then fiber. And then fiber is broken down into insoluble fiber. That would be like cellulose. And then you have soluble fiber. That's like inulin or oligo, various oligosaccharides. Uh, and then there's also like resistant starch. So resistant starch is not technically, I haven't looked at it, not technically a fiber, but it's considered, it behaves like a fiber. I'll say that. So it has some ability to ferment and, and things. So you have, you know, protein, fat, and carbs, and that's an overview. And then fiber is kind of in and of itself. Uh, there's, there's a, it's also hotly debated <laughs> if we need fiber or not, there are people who follow a carnivore diet that seem to do well, completely well on, on zero fiber. I am of the opinion based upon the massive amount of epidemiological data that having fiber anywhere from 25 to like 30 grams of car of fiber per day is probably optimal for the diet that helps to attenuate, uh, glycemic spikes. I would choose fiber, try to get it from whole food sources. So if whole food sources of carbohydrates are high in fiber, for example, broccoli is like one third fiber. And if you get it from vegetables and fruits and you make sure that those sources of carbohydrates are 20 to 30% fiber, that's going to significantly attenuate glu glucose spikes and also probably insulin too. Uh, so try to pick your carbohydrates based on their fiber consumption, I think is important. And then we could take a deep dive into the specifics of proteins and fats and uh, carbohydrates, you know, and their effects on metabolism. Yeah. We should certainly uh, dive in, into each of those 
more deeply. And, and there's obviously a ton of subject matter here to, to map. So we, we will by no means be able to cover the full spectrum of, of what's contained in, um, in the statement macronutrients. But, you know, I think th that was a, a great introduction um, to the, the main categories. And I think maybe we could also, just for, for those who are really approaching this subject for the first time, um, you know, Dom just touched on a number of, of the high level reasons that one would pay attention to these sorts of um, th these primary macronutrients. But Tom, I'm curious for you, you had started off by saying it, it's essentially the, the 101. It's the foundation for a lot of your nutrition um, curriculum. And so I'm, I'm curious, how would you describe the importance of tracking macros in one's diet? Is this something that really only applies to people who, for example, are bodybuilders or elite athletes? How, how does it apply to the everyday person? From the general perspective, from the 30,000 foot view, I think people just doing general nutrition research probably think it, their opinion, their general opinion in this field uh, is that um, it's almost like micromanaging, right? Uh, but at the same time, there's two camps in that. And one way to think about it is like kind of if it fits your macros, <laughs> there's that camp. And uh, that is an extremely effective way to, if you do it on a weekly basis and adjust your macronutrient composition and total energy intake is, I mean, I guess Weight Watchers and other other organizations have sort of profited off of this. Uh, that is the most effective way to improve your metabolic health and body composition. And there are more difficult ways to do it and easier ways. And, and the app is just amazing in that. And you can talk about the features of, you know, everything from the barcode scanning to customizing, and then, you know, do the AI features. So that has become the barrier to entry, I would say for tracking macros, the way that it, that macro tracking is used efficiently. Like what is happening that people are uh, able to improve body composition through tracking macros specifically? Are they, yeah. Could you just expand on that just a little more? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's super important to track macros and that's not, that's my personal opinion. And I think some people would disagree with that, but I think the science is going in that direction overwhelmingly because, uh, people grossly underestimate the amount of calories that they consume, especially from carbohydrates and especially from fat. So it becomes crucial to understand what your total calories are and also what your macronutrient distribution is uh, and how that will correlate to specific metabolic biomarkers that we can talk about. And, you know, you know, the high level ones are, you know, average glucose, glucose spikes, insulin, you know, but even things like HSCRP, ApoB, uric acid, uh, triglycerides, all these things are important because, you know, 95% of people are not optimal. So, and to understand why they are not optimal, they need to understand what they're eating and the macronutrient distribution of what they're eating is absolutely essential. Really the most important thing is that people grossly underestimate how much they're eating. So when they start tracking macros, and this is even true in my case where I track macros for a while, and then I essentially don't track, I track every once in a while, just if I change my diet, but I like buy 10 foods at the grocery store, like once a week and I eat the same meals every day. So I know the macronutrient composition of that. And I vary it, you know, I add it egg or two here and there, if I want to <laughs> increase or decrease weight or add an extra cup of, you know, blueberries at the end of the day, if I want to increase carbohydrates or fiber or something like that. But you have to understand your baseline and where you're starting at to make, you know, if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So the first step is measure it. Not that you have to do it all the time because some people are regimented and they have a routine where although other people, many people I know are not regimented and they eat, you know, they go out to eat. I mean, uh, they're eating, you know, from packaged foods where, I mean, the app can allow you to just scan the barcode and it pops it in there. Uh, so they're eating a, a very high variety. Their, their meals are very inconsistent. So they, so in that case, it's probably important to track macros. It's also really important if you're an athlete and you want to dial in your carbohydrate tolerance based on your CGM and other biomarkers. And, and many people like to for example, if they're in a sport to cut weight or to increase weight or increase muscle size and bulk. And to do that, you need to be very precise with your, to do that optimally, you need to calculate your initial macros and then strategize a way to increase uh, sort of protein and overall calories over time. So you can gradually put on muscle size and strength and do it in a very incremental way. 
that's not impairing metabolic health. So these are all the reasons why people in the fitness community do it. But I think the general population has so much to learn from that community. And now we have the tools available to do it. One interesting and made us maybe more succinct way I've, I've heard this stated is um, when people are confused about a lot of people have heard about calories and, and, you know, for myself, for example, I grew up with the, a calorie is a calorie tagline, just sort of seared into my brain and, and, you know, so Skittles and broccoli both contain calories, which is a unit of energy. And really it's just the amount of calories you're consuming in the two of them that would matter when determining how many calories you consumed. And if all calories are equal, which they are thermodynamically, this is a question of really energy is energy equal. And the answer to that is at an abstract level. Yes. Um, then, then it really doesn't matter what your food sources are. You're just consuming energy. Macronutrients on the other hand, pose a different question, which is that, uh, it's not are all calories equal? That is the answer is yes. It's are all macronutrients equal? And I think what you, you've just laid out for us in the intro here is that macronutrients are each fundamentally different building blocks. And when they enter the sort of chemistry set that is your body, they trigger different pathways and they are processed in different ways and have fundamentally different effects on the body and, and really can do different things. You know, carbohydrates can't uh, necessarily produce the building blocks of muscle and skin and organs the way the protein can. So paying attention to not just the sort of energetic intake and expenditures, but also the building blocks that make up that energy um, are, are really two different, but very important aspects of uh, really uh, you know, what, we're, what we're feeding ourselves and, and the sorts of uh, information we're providing and enabling our body to use in the future. If someone was tracking macronutrients over a long time frame, what sort of information would you say that they have that someone who has not tracked their macronutrients over a long time frame would not have. And, and how would this be useful in understanding the onset of conditions, changes in one's say metabolic status and biomarkers? How do those two things connect um, your sort of holistic health and your macronutrient history? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. The best answer is that you uh, are kind of living in the dark. If you're not tracking your macronutrients and you're getting unfavorable body composition changes and you're saying, well, I'm eating less calories than I'm burning, but you know, many people doing that are not precisely tracking their macros in any way, or they've cut carbs. Uh, this is what I hear a lot, almost on a daily basis. I get emails from people. Hey, I tried the ketogenic diet. I cut carbs to like less than 20 grams a day and I still kept gaining weight. And I was, I, you know, my response is, okay, ha have you been tracking your macronutrients and your calories? And their, their response is like, well, I didn't think you had to do that if you <laughs> went on a low carb diet or ketogenic diet. It's really important for those who have tracked macronutrients and have, have a history of doing that. They will have a very clear understanding about how changing macronutrients, how changing diet composition impacts their overall health, their body composition, their hunger. And, and their weight in general, you know, it's just like, I mean, whereas someone who has fluctuated in weight over time may attribute those weight gain and fluctuations to eating a particular food or stress or something else where <laughs> the reality is the truth is that they're, um, uh, they were overeating or they're under eating if they're losing weight and, and they could basically claim that I was eating the same thing, but my weight has been fluctuating up and down. And they may attribute it to specific macronutrient compositions. And that, that could be a factor. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, that's a factor that it's not a factor because some people, uh, really do very well on a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet. And some people do very well on higher carbohydrate diets. My, my wife, for example, you know, chooses to eat a higher carb diet and does really well. And our biomarkers are pretty much the same, but I think the person not tracking macros would just kind of in the dark. And I think if they start doing it, it'll be eye opening and it'll help to sort of clarify, uh, you know, their, their body composition issues. And, and they, then, then they can plan according to that. And, and it doesn't have to be an abrupt, you know, thrust into tracking macros to every gram. Uh, but I think just, just general, you can ease into it. And we see that sometimes it's better for people to kind of ease into it. So starting to pay attention to it in some capacity is better than ignoring it altogether. Um, you, you mentioned a few dietary philosophies there, and I was excited to, to kind of step into some of those next are, are the different diet fads or names or philosophies 
are they really fundamentally just macronutrient differences or composition differences? You know, what, what sets apart a ketogenic diet from, for example, a carnivore diet? And it, does this come down to a macro composition? And is that what, what causes the, any positive effects someone might see? And, uh, and from there, I've, I've got a few other questions, which we can get, get into on the, on the interpersonal differences and how somebody responds to a specific diet. Humans are incredibly adaptable to a wide spectrum of macronutrient and diet compositions. So that's like super key. Not all species are able to do that. Uh, in addition, we can follow vastly different macronutrient compositions and have metabolic adaptations to that composition that can be favorable or unfavorable. So, uh, and that'll be partly dependent upon individual variability, uh, genetics, even, you know, some people are poor oxidizers of fatty acids or poor, you know, uh, or have various things that make them susceptible to different metabolic derangements. So uh, even me, I got my genetic results back this week and it's really interesting to kind of look through that and see that I have specific mutations for like cholesterol transporters and things like that, that I'm making actionable adjustments to the app tracking macros would be absolutely essential to make those adjustments. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you know, for high carb diets are perfectly fine. If your carb tolerance is good and your glucose is under control and your, uh, that includes your mean glucose levels. And that could be an aggregate of glucose measured by hemoglobin A1C, but, more importantly, the glucose excursions after a meal would be a more precise and informative uh, variable to measure in response to, you know, uh, following a higher carb diet. And the people who thrive and do really well on high carb diets tend to have a very nice, appropriate, you know, metabolic response and, and insulin management to high carb, whereas a, a large majority of people do not. And some degree of carbohydrate restriction would produce favorable changes in their metabolic health and body composition, but they do not have to be extreme to the point of a ketogenic diet. And I think that's where people think it's like low carb or high carb. <laughs> there's, there's a spectrum that we need to appreciate. And, uh, and I think from just a very simple, I mean, just reducing carbs from 60% to, uh, you know, which is like the standard American diet is like, you know, 300 grams of carbs or more for someone my size. Uh, but if, and I could probably even tolerate that, I may not thrive on that, but if I uh, just dialing it back to 150 grams of carbs for someone, my size, maybe not in the optimal health can have enormous, you know, favorable changes. Then the question is, how do you fill the gap from the macros that you're pulling out in the form of carbs? Do you put that back in as fat? Do you put it in as protein? I think if you, uh, if we eat in the upper range of protein, which is one gram per pound, it's a good equalizer and it helps to provide, you know, improve body composition. Uh, we have better satiety with higher protein diets, including protein in with your meal also attenuates glucose and insulin fluctuations. So I think whether you're in a high carb camp or the low carb camp, I think centralizing protein is probably the most important thing to do. And then it really comes down to your diet preference and what you're used to eating and, and the foods that you enjoy eating. Uh, so you have to balance that with the biomarkers that we can talk about and, and your glucose control and then find a happy medium there. But I don't like to, we do research on ketogenic diets and low carb diets, and they have very specific and important therapeutic applications, but I do not like to proselytize and <laughs> try to convert everyone on high carb to low carb. It's just like, uh, and I don't think that's helpful or useful. I think it's much more nuanced. Um, and we need, you know, technology like this and biomarker tracking to understand what works best for us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is a really good intro. And I think that summarized point there is that, you know, we almost don't have to use these, these buckets, these label buckets and force everybody into a high or a low of, of really anything. We have the potential now to, to, to start to build that nuance in and each individual can, can sort of converge on the composition that, that works best for them. I think what's important and what previously, and I'd love to get into some of the specifics on this it's not just the inputs of tracking macros. We also have the potential now to measure the outputs. So how your body then responds to those macros. And so you can do this almost closed loop of, 
adjusting the inputs, seeing how the outputs shift, and then dialing it in. And then eventually you're really converging on something that is uniquely ideal for you, the individual, even if it may not work for somebody who thrives on some some other compositions. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Great, so I, I'd love to uh, maybe from here dig into the individual major macronutrients um, directly. So we, you know, we've touched on some of the the high level benefits and, and use cases for each macronutrient. Why don't we just continue the thread with protein um, you, you had started? So I, I think we've sort of touched on why protein is an important macronutrient. It's really you know, the amino acids that make up proteins are, are the fundamental building blocks of, of uh, the tissues and structures in our bodies. Is there, is there another, would you add anything else to why protein is an important macronutrient and, and one that we need to make, make sure that we are consuming in adequate quantity? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important to emphasize that, uh, protein should be like central. We should really make sure that we're getting on a daily basis, uh, adequate protein every day. And that will set the stage for good dietary patterns. And I, my belief too, and I think the literature supports this is that, uh, ensuring that you get adequate protein in with each meal probably prevents overeating, uh, just because of the satiety factor. Uh, of course, you know, from a fitness standpoint, it ensures that we provide the building blocks for skeletal muscle mass, uh, enzymes, antibodies, hair, nails, things like that, things that people <laughs> are feel important. Uh, there is a debate whether, you know, how many feedings of protein is optimal per day. And I think if you refer to some of the experts on this, like Stu Phillips and uh, Dr. Donald Lehman, uh, I think the general consensus is one meal a day, which is a trend for some people is probably not ideal that you want to separate and spread out your protein feedings. Uh, and that could be, you could separate and spread them out in you know, even an eight hour window, if you want to do intermittent fasting but two to four feedings per day is probably optimal. Whereas if we're eating, and I did this in the past when I was younger, like six to eight times a day, your body actually becomes refractory to the stimulus, the skeletal muscle protein stimulus, for example, leucine can stimulate that almost becomes refractory to it. If with frequent feedings every day where you're not giving your digestive system a break, people in the fitness world are always trying to amp up and maximize skeletal muscle protein synthesis. And if we're eating all the time and we don't go through a period where I guess you would call it semi fasting or in an unfed state, uh, then you don't, uh, there's literature to support that if you're constantly feeding smaller meals throughout the day, you do not get the same skeletal muscle protein synthesis response to uh, feeding if you give your body sort of a break and then uh, circulating levels of amino acids go down, the metabolic machinery that's associated with stimulating skeletal muscle protein synthesis is sort of resensitized to another feeding and a protein feeding and various amino acids are, can be the signal, for example, like leucine. So, uh, and some people, there's a, there's some, a similar phenomenon that happens as we age that this protein synthesis machinery is not activated in such a robust way when we're younger and we're growing, especially in the teenage years, we are super sensitive to things like IGF one and other hormones to stimulate um, anabolic activity, especially in skeletal muscle and growth. And then those, uh, hormones and those factors, hormones are maybe not, they be, they become reduced as we age, but also our sensitivity to them, uh, is thought to diminish too. And that there's a term that people use, it's called like anabolic resistance as we age. And I think, uh, an important thing to mention is that some people think you should eat less protein as you get older, but you should actually increase and really focus on getting more protein as being a central component of your diet, you know, with age. And that's going to preserve and maintain your lean body mass. As our skeletal muscle increases and our strength increases, that correlates very tightly with, uh, with bone mineral density and the strength of your bones, which could be measured with DEXA over time. And of course, like exercise greatly enhances the efficiency of protein utilization. So if you ensure that you get enough protein and you do exercise, especially resistance exercise, it'll make sure that protein is, uh, is utilized in the best way possible in regards to building and maintaining, uh, the skeletal structure and the muscle structure. Ton there. Super interesting, especially the point about 
um, consuming more protein over time as we age, just, you know, I think it's counterintuitive if the body is able to use protein less efficiently over time, it, it sort of leads to a conclusion potentially that, oh, well, in that case, we shouldn't overdo it. In fact, we should lower the, you know, maybe the, the load of protein that we're providing, but it's, it's actually the opposite as you're saying. And, um, what, what are some other misconceptions that people might have about protein? I mean, I, I'd love to hear, you know, for example, whether you would recommend for someone who is trying to lose weight that they reduce all macronutrients, including protein, or if someone's trying to lose weight, you know, is there some benefit to maintaining a higher level of protein relative to the other macros? Um, and a recent example of this that I think is really common people are thinking a lot about is uh, GLP-1 agonists. So the, a lot of people are taking these, these pharmaceutical interventions that are causing whole body um, weight loss and is there some benefit, for example, in that accelerated weight loss to maintaining a protein intake that would be higher than they otherwise would? Yeah. Great topic. Uh, yeah. With protein, I just want to touch on like another protein misconception is that it's toxic, right? So uh, I guess, you know, when I was younger, I had excessive protein intake, you know, at some times, you know, and, and drinking protein shakes between meals and things like that. And I remember, uh, and this could happen in someone just exercising very hard, just smelling like ammonia. Like, especially if, you know, taking off your clothes and almost stings your eyes, like you're smelling like ammonia. So, uh, one of the most common questions or, you know, it's kind of a myth is that protein can be toxic or excess protein. And that could be the case for someone with impaired kidney function or renal function. So you want to track like your, your blood urea nitrogen, track your creatinine, um, get your glomerular filtration rate or that calculated rate. That's going to be important if you're considering like a higher protein diet or listening to this and thinking, oh, I got to double my protein intake. Just make sure you get labs that show, you know, you're, you're, you're not, you don't have impairment of kidney function. Some people don't realize that they might have, you know, like polycystic kidney disease or something. They, they realize it later on in life. Uh, but so your question was sort of optimizing like protein protein intake and what would be sort of the optimal way to go about that? Well, I think protein is typically considered, you know, I, th I think a lot of people associate it with uh, bodybuilding and people who are trying to gain muscle. And so I, I'm, I'm curious to hear, you know, are there, is there a misconception there where it's only for the sort of anabolic mode when you're trying to gain muscle mass, or is there some benefit to maintaining high body or a high protein intake, even if you're actually trying to do the opposite and trying to lose body weight? Yeah. Okay. So I think the general consensus is that you could probably consume up to two grams of protein per pound. <laughs> that sounds like a lot. That'd be like me over 400 grams. So, uh, but that is probably not optimal. So I think to get to your question, protein is essential and super important for maintaining, uh, skeletal muscle mass tissues like hair and nails. Uh, and skin and, and your immune system and all the enzymes that are part of your metabolism. Uh, but when you, after you meet the basic requirements, which is probably about 0.75 grams, you know, or, or let's say the upper limit, I think is like one gram per kilogram or one gram per pound, sorry. Uh, and two, you know, of, of ideal body weight. So uh, if you're 220 pounds, 220 grams of protein. It sounds like a lot, but typically, you know, if you're active and you have more skeletal muscle mass, then you're going to need more protein, but protein is not, is not a good energetic fuel. So you want to make sure that your protein requirements are met, but not excessive. And you want to fill in the gap, uh, of your macronutrients with good energy sources. And that could be, uh, carbohydrates and, fat. So in some cases, one or the other, depending upon, well, even if you're on a high carb diet, you want to make sure that you're getting enough fat to get the essential fatty acids you need. So we can talk about, you know, the omega sixes and omega threes, your fats and your carbohydrates are there for energy and fuel. And they also help to fuel the rebuilding process and ensure that protein synthesis and protein metabolism is optimal because that's an energy dependent process. And you want to derive the energy from not so much uh, protein and the associated amino acids, but you want to, you know, get your energy from fats and carbohydrates. Kind of view it from that perspective is that protein is for building and maintaining, but not for energy. A protein sparing modified fast <laughs> is really like a super calorie restricted, higher protein diet. Uh, and I think you asked the question in the context of a caloric restriction, 
you do, you actually want to keep protein. You don't want to decrease protein in the context of a calorie deficit because your body will be more catabolic. Uh, so you want to decrease, uh, fats and carbohydrates, create that energy deficit, and then protect your lean body mass with, uh, maintaining your protein levels and just reduce calories through reducing fat and carbohydrates. Small adjustments are really nothing extreme. The faster you lose weight, the more likely it will be muscle. And the more likely that the calorie deficit will result in a reduced metabolism, uh, in the form of like reduced T4 to T3 conversion and thyroid and just over like your body temperature will go down. Whereas if you do it slow and gradual, you're more likely to maintain not only your muscle mass, but also your performance, your energy levels and things like that. So it's important to do it gradual, but to not drop your protein levels. I think that's such an important, uh, segment right there on the, the, the goals that most people have are to be able to adjust body mass without, you know, slowing proportionally their, their metabolic rate and continuing to be, be able to eat to society and, and all that without, you know, gaining that weight right back. And so I think that the role of protein in maintaining lean body mass and, and basal metabolic rate relative to the other macros uh, can't be, can't be overstated there. Let's, uh, let's maybe talk, uh, as a last topic here on protein about some of the maybe markers of protein consumption. You, you touch on a few of them, but how do we know, um, when we're consuming too much or too little protein and specifically, you know, you touched on kidneys, uh, you know, is this something basically can, can overconsumption of protein actually drive issues for someone who doesn't have pre-existing kidney issues? And if so, are they just kidney related? Um, what about gout is, is mTOR or IGF one, a concern with overconsumption? A lot of folks, especially those who might be eating, um, maybe more of a plant-based diet, uh, have read a lot about the potential downsides of, of protein. I'd love to just address some of those. People are really scared <laughs> and I get enough emails to make me realize that people are really scared of higher protein as it pertains to, uh, maybe reducing longevity, uh, stressing not only your kidneys, but your liver too. And I will mention, I, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm, it's very clear to me that if I eat a large amount of protein, if I was to double my protein intake today and, and get blood work in two weeks, my liver enzymes would be elevated from, you know, the twenties to the forties or fifties. So I've seen this time and time again, I've proven it to myself that, you know, whether that increase in liver enzyme function is, you know, pathological, usually you have to get, you know, three or four times elevation of liver enzymes to indicate, uh, some. so, uh, I think it's important to look at, you know, do your labs, your liver enzymes, your blood urea, nitrogen, your creatinine. Uh, of course, if you smell any kind of smell of ammonia, especially if you're working out, uh, that, that is an indicator of higher protein catabolism. And that's seen in people that are in a calorie deficit, maybe people taking lots of stimulants to, you know, and they're over exercising, doing cardio. Uh, you typically kind of see these things, um, but it's, I think it's kind of really hard to overdo it on protein, especially as we age. And, uh, if you're concerned about it, then it's really important to just track your biomarkers. So your kidney function and, um, protein will increase insulin too. So if you have hyperinsulinemia it, and you're, you're eating a very high protein diet and everything else is kind of like dialed in, you might want to reduce your protein a little bit and, you'll get a more favorable reduction in insulin with carbohydrates. Uh, but you might want to try a diet that's moderate in protein, higher in fat and low in carbohydrates, but maybe higher in fiber. So, and, and do that approach too, but I, I can't really bash protein. There's not too many things. <laughs> and I think generally speaking, when you talk to people and they think they're going in the direction of like a healthy longevity diet, plant-based diet, and you, you look at their macronutrient distribution, uh, it's deficient in protein. And I think that that's not going to be helpful as we age. Uh, I'd also like to, to just kind of throw in there that exercise, you could follow like a relatively low protein diet, but if you're exercising a lot and you have great metabolic health, then your sensitivity to that protein that you're eating, uh, could be high and that could be enough for you. So on the, you know, I've, I've seen people like on really lower protein diets, but they're just in really good metabolic shape and they do resistance training and they're not deficient in muscle size or strength and they're somehow maintaining it. 
of course, genetics play into that too. And, and what your body composition was, you know, in your earlier years, if you built up a lot of, of surplus in muscle <laughs> currency, metabolic currency, and you've, you know, you've added a lot of muscle when you're younger, that muscle is far, far easier to maintain than, uh, it is building muscle in later age. So if we've gone through the duration, you know, our lifespan with not a lot of muscle and we want to gain muscle because we're reaching critically low levels of muscle, it becomes really important to increase your protein. Whereas if you are into resistance training when you're younger, uh, it's going to be very easy to much easier to maintain that muscle, maybe even on a lower, uh, protein diet. Fascinating. I, I, I would love to go deep down that rabbit hole and, and, uh, I'm sure there's a whole episode available for that one, but, um, yeah, I think, I think we really covered the spectrum there on protein. There's, there's maybe one, um, additional biomarker. I'd, I'd love to kind of hear your input on as it relates to protein and that's uric acid. So uric acid is coming up a lot. We, we've, we certainly get a ton of questions about it. We've produced some content on it, but how does uric acid play into the protein synthesis and or metabolism feedback loop? Higher protein diets can definitely increase uric acid. Uh, my, my uric acid usually runs about 2.5 or something like that. Uh, but I, I was tinkering with it and communicating with Dr. Perlmutter on this and we were experimenting, we were sending pictures back and forth and I had a big meal of liver, some red wine and some fruit. And I think, uh, an hour, a couple hours after that, I was up to seven and I think that was my highest. So <laughs> foods that are high in purines will increase uric acid. Uh, uric acid will also increase with, uh, fructose consumption, especially excess fructose consumption is a driver of high uric acid. So uric acid, uh, correlates is a really important metabolic biomarker and correlates with, uh, metabolic dysregulation from hyperinsulinemia to inflammation to gout, you know, obviously, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So uric acid is a really important biomarker to track. And I think more recently people are, you know, uh, paying attention to this, uh, Excess protein can contribute to higher uric acid. Uh, so it's something that you want to track. Although I followed and other people I know have followed higher protein diets for a long time and their uric acid is perfectly normal. It's more of a feature of excess consumption of a purine rich diet in the context of poor metabolic health. Whereas people that are, have good metabolic health can tolerate high levels of protein and even purine rich foods like liver and organ meats and maintain relatively low uric acid levels. Uh, but, you know, alcohol, high fructose, uh, consumption, not so much from whole foods, especially from sugar sweetened beverages, obviously. Uh, but also if you have good metabolic health and uric acid trends on the high side, you might want to just, uh, look at the purine content of the protein foods that you're eating and then reduce, reduce that, for example, like, uh, more, you know, if you're eating more red meat and organ meats and things like that, and certain, uh, shellfish and seafood are higher in purines, you might want to just eat lower purine sources of, of protein, like, uh, eggs and things like that. Awesome. So last question on protein is what are your specific strategies around protein consumption? You mentioned you have a, a pretty high protein uh, diet. Do you take supplements for protein? Do you recommend, um, you know, you mentioned maybe, maybe thinking about purine sources, but how about timing, uh, supplements, overall strategy? Supplements can be really handy, especially if you just don't have the appetite to get the whole food sources of protein in. I think supplements are essential for someone following a vegan diet, maybe a vegetarian diet, if you're not getting in a lot of eggs. Uh, otherwise just, I enjoy eating and I enjoy protein food, <laughs> the meat and fish and chicken and and eggs. So, uh, I don't, uh, years ago I did lots of protein supplements and can't say they hurt me. Uh, but nowadays I really like to just get my, uh, protein from whole food sources. I think it's going to be ideal. Uh, also from the, from the perspective of the micronutrients and other things that you'll find in whole food sources like beef and liver and eggs. Uh, with the yolk, of course. Uh, so I think that's important. However, uh, we, we do research on different disease processes where it becomes really hard for people, whether it's, you know, age-related dementia or cancer, cancer cachexia, where people just don't have the appetite to eat. 
and I think in that context, protein supplements are are super important and potentially even life saving because reduction in skeletal muscle mass correlates with function. And that's a big driver for mortality in many of the disease processes that we study. So I think it depends on your ability to get the, the protein that you need in whole food sources. And if you can't, uh, there are many, uh, you know, with, with protein, uh, whey is ideal if you can tolerate dairy based protein, but, um, uh, there's, you know, Mark Bell has the steak shake, which is a beef based, uh, protein supplement. There's, uh, there's an egg based, uh, protein supplement. And, and now there's fairly good, although they're not my, wouldn't be my go-to, uh, plant-based, uh, protein supplements are out there too. Uh, if you're following a vegan diet would be important that, you know, you really want to pay attention in those cases to the, uh, essential amino acid profile. There's nine essential amino acids and make sure that there's sufficient amounts of lysine and methionine in those plant sources of, uh, protein. Super deep dive on protein so far, tons to, uh, to extract from that conversation. Let's, let's move into carbs. So carbohydrates, um, another major, one of, one of the big three, we can call them macronutrients. So just if you could tee off with why are carbs an important macronutrient and, um, and maybe some initial role that the carbohydrates play in the body. Carbohydrates are not essential, but I think they're optimal in the human diet to include it, especially from the context of. Uh, the fiber and all the various uh, phytonutrients that you get from eating vegetables and fruits, for example, uh, and the energy that they supply in the form of sugar, which is not all bad. We have to kind of uh, view these things from the context of uh, excess carbohydrates are bad and can quickly become bad to metabolic health. But we have carbohydrates in the form of sugars, as mentioned, monosaccharides, disaccharides, even glycogen from some sources like liver, starch, and then we have uh, fiber, it's soluble and insoluble. And then we have resistant starch, which is kind of becoming a, a, a popular supplement now. And, and different people are, you know, for example, uh, doing potatoes and showing the difference between, <laughs> you know, uh, resistant starch, uh, after it sits in the refrigerator and things. And that's, that's kind of an interesting area because you could alter starch in a way to make it much more satiating and reducing the glycemic response. So that's becoming sort of a trend recently, but, uh, macronutrient tracking is sort of probably most important from the context of tracking carbohydrates to understand our carbohydrate tolerance. And this is super important in various coaches and trainers that I know that dial in the carbohydrates they're using CGM. Many of them are using levels to really dial in the carbohydrates to figure out the optimal level of carbohydrates for performance and body composition, but also not to spill over is a term that they use where, uh, they're dumping insulin and, um, and also excess carbohydrates will make you hold water and that's not favorable for body composition or performance. In excess carbohydrates, I think is the problem that many people talk about. Sugar sweetened beverages, processed foods, obviously, will impact your amine glucose levels, most visible on a CGM, but also hemoglobin A1C, and probably the most important biomarker, cardiometabolic biomarker, is triglycerides. So my tri I was pretty healthy person eating a high carb diet. And my triglycerides were not optimal somewhere around approaching like 80 to hundred, but I was, you know, good body composition, great overall health, good biomarkers. And then years ago, when I switched to low carb keto, it went down into the forties, my triglycerides, insulin, uh, hyperinsulinemia is most quickly reversed with reducing with carbohydrate restriction, some degree of it doesn't have to be <laughs> zero carbs. And, uh, an experiment that I did about a year ago now was I, transition to eating, you know, low carb, like 50 grams to 200 grams a day, maybe 250 for two weeks. And then I did a full blood panel again, and my insulin level did not change. My hemoglobin A1C maybe trended up a little bit, but what changed, what was a, a real change that I observed was an increase in high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So my inflammation, and it went from 0 0.1 to like 1.2, you know, which is still kind of low, 
but I track that biomarker so many times, dozens, if not hundreds of times with, uh, over, you know, the last two decades that I, uh, there was no reason for that to go up other than just increasing my carbohydrates. And I clamped everything that I didn't have any increase or decrease in body weight. If anything, I lost a pound or two. So, you know, I was in a calorie deficit. And this kind of correlates to a past history where a higher carb diet was triggering things like um, eczema in me and maybe maybe uh, triggering like a mild autoimmune. That could have been to the type of carbohydrates, it probably was, uh, but not sort of carbohydrates in general. But I'll say with my carb experiment, I was, you know, eating sweet potatoes. I was eating very healthy forms of carbohydrates, um, but I did see that trend up. So that was just two weeks. I don't know what would happen if I would extend that to a longer period of time. Yeah, it's fascinating. I've, I've, I've had a somewhat similar experience myself. And, you know, I think what, what a lot of the conversation around protein converged on is that protein is a, it, it's fundamentally essential. It's, it's part of the building block of blocks of, of every, everyone's body and the important tissues in it. Um, it, it's not so for carbs, as you, as you said, um, not, not essential though likely ideal to have some form of carbohydrates involved in, in the diet. Um, for people who are experiencing some uh, sort of consequence of over or under consumption of carbohydrates, they might see things, as you mentioned, like insulin changing, might see inflammation going up as evidenced by a, a CRP measurement. Um, they may uh, experience, or, or maybe let I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, but those are some of the biomarker indications. What would some of the like qualitative indications be? Uh, you know, in your case, you said eczema or some other inflammatory condition. Yeah. What, what would most people want to be looking for to understand like maybe that, that this could be what they're experiencing is, is potentially carbohydrate related. Yeah. Fluctuations in energy level is probably the biggest thing that I, that I noticed when switching to a low carb diet, I kind of would rephrase it to uh, glucose homeostasis management and insulin management. So essentially what that allowed me to do is to keep very steady and consistent energy level throughout the day. And for my occupation, that was really important because I'd have, you know, long work hours in the lab or writing papers or teaching or whatever, that that actually became like a really a big advantage, like switching over. Uh, and prior to that, I was eating good. I would have, you know, a can of tuna fish and rice, or, you know, a potato and chicken or something like that. But I do remember if I wore a CGM the, back then, it would have been like night and day. And, you know, if you're eating even a healthy, you know, mixed meal with carbohydrates, you have the characteristic rise in glucose. And that could be 30, 40, 60, uh, you know, milligrams per deciliter. And then what often happens in, in people is that you have the postprandial dip that could occur one, two, three hours after where you're mildly, uh, not clinically hypoglycemic, but mildly hypoglycemic to the point where you just kind of want to sleep or you just, you know, you just don't feel as energetic. Uh, whereas if you promote metabolic flexibility, which is best achieved through carbohydrate restriction, it gets your body used to burning fat for energy, your glycemia and your insulin levels are more stabilized. Uh, also if your carbohydrates are restricted to a significant degree, you start producing ketones and then those ketones can kind of fill the gap in brain energy. So if your glucose does become low, uh, the ketones are essentially a safety net. So you're essentially asymptomatic for hypoglycemia. Uh, if you're on a ketogenic diet or even doing, uh, things like intermittent fasting and that metabolic flexibility can have really tangible, um, effects that, uh, subjective effects that are really important. And, and, you know, a lot of people, uh, that's why people will gravitate, even if they're not metabolically managing a disorder that is, you know, can be helpful for a ketogenic diet. They do it as a lifestyle, uh, being in a mild state of ketosis just for the energy flow. Yeah. it's a great one. The qualitative experience there. And then, and then the relationship, you know, between that, that energetic flow for me, the highs and lows, um, which the, the major indicator for me that something was off in my diet was exactly this. It was, it was energy crashes. And, and what's interesting is that correlation between, uh, glucose elevations, insulin release to, to pull that glucose out of the bloodstream 
the energy crashes. But for other people that can also manifest through uh, that the continued insulin elevations in weight gain as well, right? Uh, that, that could be a, another indication that maybe somebody is, is driving the the, the glucose, uh, maybe it's spilling over is, is I think the phrase you had used. So what are the relationships? What's the relationship maybe between overconsumption of carbohydrates and weight? Of all the macronutrients, uh, I do think carbohydrates are the easiest to overconsume. Like, you know, people will debate whether carbohydrates or sugars are addicting or not. And I think there's good evidence to support, you know, their effects on uh, on reward dopaminergic reward pathways that are analogous to dopamine inducing, uh, recreational drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine. So actually I teach in part of this and just show people who are, have obesity, for example, just have lower dopamine levels and they're kind of self-medicating, uh, for that. And I mean, this is accepted at, at least in the context of obesity, but I don't think the the general consensus, at least in the nutrition field where I come from, the, the conventional view is that sugar is not addictive, although I think the research is going in that direction. So um, so I think with, with obesity, especially in the younger population where they have access to sugar-sweetened beverages and processed food, uh, and they're creating... Uh, really unfavorable dietary patterns at such a young age, then those patterns are going to be super hard to break, you know, over time, unless they just go down the rabbit hole of embracing their own metabolic health, which most people don't. I mean, listen, you know, I grew up on box cereal and pop tarts and things like that. And kind of, I probably because I gravitated more towards like fitness and stuff uh, in, in high school that I steer away from that, but the large majority of people don't. And I think that carbohydrates are, sort of the macronutrient that we have to pay most attention to because they're the easiest to overconsume, And I think they have, uh, they can be addicting definitely for some people. And, and I think that carb management uh, through macronutrient tracking is probably the most important thing. And carbohydrates, you know, mixed with fat and salt and things create a uh, hyper palatability uh, where, so I don't want to demonize carbohydrates completely because fat, especially in, especially the fat that's in processed food, which tends to be omega-6 uh, seed oil type fats and not, not so much fats from whole food sources like steak and eggs and, uh, but fat that's found with carbohydrates in processed food uh, and sort of amped up in palatability with salt and other things um, are, you know, can be problematic too. Well, the interesting thing about carbohydrates, given it's, it's one of the, as you said, likely the most important to, to pay close attention to, uh, is that we have an indicator, in, a real-time indicator in the CGM that allows us to be able to see, uh, you know, we can't see all of the monosaccharides. We can't, uh, we can't, for example, track fructose directly, but we can see glucose excursions. And uh, typically the sources that we're getting include at least uh, you know, sucro sucrose or uh, some glucose in them. So we're able to, to see an indication of how much carbohydrate load we're taking on in a single meal, which is a really powerful tool. And then coupled with that macronutrient tracking, we can start to see the, the input, right? The macro we consumed and then the output, how our bodies were, were able to respond to, it, which has for me been an, an entirely new paradigm for how I've, I've approached my, my diet composition. Um, I'm curious about your strategies around carb consumption. So I uh, would love to just kind of hear how, how you approach it, what, what your sources are, do you, do you supplement anything related to carb consumption, um, resistant starch or anything like that, probiotics, and then just timing of your, of your carbs if you, if you are consuming them? I feel best the last you know decade or more, I feel best really on like, I haven't had almost no carbohydrates all day. <laughs> and I tend to then do, I guess if you want to call it backfeed carbohydrates in later in the day, which, off, which also correlates with my activity level during the day, I'm just not active. For one thing, that's why I don't consume them. Uh, when I wake up, sometimes I do cut like the very tips of the broccoli floret off <laughs> in my in my uh, omelet, and I'll give you know the stalk or whatever to my dogs. They just kind of love that, and they seem to benefit from the fiber. Uh, and sometimes I will like cut up an onion if I put in like some cheese in my omelet or something like that. But otherwise, almost zero carbohydrates throughout the the. The morning and throughout the afternoon uh, and then in the evening we typically have some kind of vegetable a salad chicken beef uh, 
fish, liver, something like that. And protein will be the central component. And then, um, I typically do, if I'm going to work out, I'll do it before dinner and then have an amount of carbohydrates. that's maybe about 30 grams of carbs. But my rule is like in the carbohydrates that I pick at least one quarter to a third of that carbohydrate content is fiber. So that seems to really cause like no insulin, no glucose response on my CGM at all. So especially when you eat it with a mixed meal and then, uh, and then after dinner, we always do like 99% of the time, unless the weather's really bad, uh, a fairly lengthy walk, like an hour or more than I do activity outside, uh, catch up on things just like outside, uh, and that's when I always get my lowest glucose level. So after my carbohydrate feeding, uh, I work out and then dinner, which is probably the biggest meal of the day, you typically always over a thousand calories. And then in the evening, I do have the munchies at night. I tend to eat probably more than most people would recommend, uh, in the evening, but I have some kind of like chocolate keto mousse thing, chocolate ice cream. Sometimes like I'll do like the rebel ice cream here and there. Uh, but I also have fruit. So, uh, wild blueberries every night, maybe an apple and some pistachios, uh, is typical. And the, my total carbohydrate consumption is usually anywhere from 30 on higher weekends, maybe up to a hundred. But like I said, uh, I tend to pick carbohydrates that are about 25 to 30% fiber. So, and these are things, uh, However, sometimes I'll eat like watermelon and sometimes, you know, we have mango trees and I'll eat a mango. Yeah. If I eat a mango on an empty stomach, man, that, that shoots it up more than a candy bar. But when you combine carbohydrates, uh, well, if the carbohydrates have fiber, then that's a huge equalizing effect there, but consuming that in the presence of protein, uh, or source of fat really creates almost a non-significant increase in CGM. If the carbohydrates are a moderate amount, you know, 200 grams of carbs are going to shoot you up obviously, but 20, 30 grams of carbs are not even going to put a dent in the CGM often. So portion control, a lot of timing decisions there, especially around exercise and, and incorporating kind of a complete macronutrient, complete meal that really meshes well with what I have kind of started to converge on. I do consume more carbs than, than you are. Are you, um, kind of in a continual ketogenic protocol is that is that your approach still yeah i'm like borderline threshold ketogenesis it's like you keep my body hungry for carbohydrates but i don't starve it and i think that in my case uh, if i dialed carbohydrates back to like 20 grams a day i think i do produce some level of insulin resistance where my insulin actually starts to creep up a little bit but you know adding 60 you know to 70 grams of carbs a day with one third of that being fiber keeps my insulin sensitivity high. So if I do eat carbohydrates, occasionally I'll have like popcorn or I'll get like a watermelon or something like that. Then I have really good glycemic control. And, uh, and interestingly during my two week carb experiment with like 200, 250 grams of carbs, my insulin level pretty much stayed the same. Uh, it might've creeped up a tiny bit, but my hemoglobin A1C, it all stayed the same pretty much. Whereas if I, I didn't go from a super strict ketogenic diet to that. I went from just like, you know, low carb, but not ketogenic. Whereas when I do follow a very strict ketogenic diet and I introduce carbs back in, I do notice, uh, for sure a bigger postprandial rise in glucose. And not that that was like a warning sign for me because, uh, but at the same time, I like eating certain vegetables and fruits and things like that. So over, over time I added them back in and I found out what, you know, um, I could essentially keep the same CGM <laughs> uh, profile uh, and same biomarkers uh, and some of them actually improved. So more recently, I've been really doing experiments on uh, LDL and ApoB. And I think, you know, excess fat consumption, especially saturated fat can, and this is debatable, excess fat, saturated fat may decrease, uh, inhibit the LDL receptor and may increase ApoB production. So there's still some debate about that. And it's an area that I'm super interested in. But what I noticed is that when I increased my carbohydrates from like 25 grams a day to like 60 or 70 per day, my LDL and ApoB went down. And more recently I did some genetic testing and I have a mutation in the NPC1L1 <laughs> 
transporter that transports cholesterol in the gut. And, uh, and I had a hyper response to a drug called azetamide, which inhibits that. So when I took a low dose of azetamide, it essentially cut my LDL and ApoB in half. And this is not something I expected. So I went down the rabbit hole <laughs> and just trying to find out why this happened. Uh, I did not want to take a statin or something, but I was just curious as to why it was elevated. So as of now, I'm doing like an experiment on almost microdosing. <laughs> Azetamide, which is also sold under Zetia, to mildly reduce the hyperabsorption of cholesterol. Because I also just kind of looked into like how much cholesterol, fat, and cholesterol did like our early ancestors eat, and I eat about five to ten times. <laughs> the, I'm literally getting like five to ten grams of cholesterol a day, and some depending on who you ask or what reference you look at. But the most cited references are saying like early man only ate like. 500 milligrams to like a thousand grams of cholesterol a day at the height. And I calculated my cholesterol and I'm like an order of magnitude above that, like several times more. So, so maybe my diet's kind of unphysiological in that way. And so maybe, but I prefer this and I seem to thrive on it except for the elevated ApoB, which is part of the biomarker <laughs> tracking that level. So, so, um, so yeah, I'm doing an experiment now, but also titrating carbohydrates back in and fiber is, is another non-pharmacological way to lower LDL and ABOB. Fascinating. So that, that correlation there is, is one that I wanted to, to touch on, um, in the next segment. So yeah, we've, we've connected the dots between carbohydrate intake, how it plays a role in the body, especially energy levels, weight, some of the biomarkers, insulin. A1C, CGM that you can track, triglycerides, which, which you had seen, you know, as, as a case study in, in yourself changing dramatically from a, a, a change in just carbohydrate consumption. Um, so there's a lot of feedback we can get from carbohydrates, um, leading into what, what I think we'll, we'll take as our last macro, which is fat. I, I'd love to bridge that with fiber. So fiber, a technically a carbohydrate, uh, or a form of, of carbohydrates is it a macronutrient? And um, let's let's just maybe dive into the sources of fiber and how we, you know, you, for example, use fiber in your diet today. Well, people will debate this. And I think it is true that fiber is not essential. Some references will actually say, and some websites will say that it is essential. Uh, but I think it's highly beneficial for the composition and to some extent, the diversity of our microbiome. Uh, which creates, uh, which can help build a number of bacterial species, uh, including acromantia, for example, that creates uh, the mucus lining, the mucus barrier on the brush border membrane. And so that could be sort of important. Uh, so you have the fiber can be uh, soluble and you have uh, inulin would be an example and insoluble would be cellulose. And there's many examples of both. And I've done a deep dive and talked about fiber, uh, with a number of different people. And although I say fiber is not essential, I think getting a minimum of 20 to 30 grams a day can be highly beneficial. And this is based on a mountain of epidemiological data, which is not perfect, but I think very informative and insightful in, uh, in showing the benefits of fiber. There's also potential uh, and I have this too, uh, problems with excess fiber can cause uh, perhaps even small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, can cause irritation, can cause flatulence, can, can just be, some people do not tolerate it, almost have an allergic reaction <laughs> to certain uh, carbohydrates or high fiber carbohydrates, or even just some forms of like supplemental fiber. I'm of the opinion that we should try to get fiber as much as possible from uh, whole food sources, although uh, maybe people that are on a purely meat-based diet, if they want to experiment with fiber, things like, you know, psyllium husk or uh, other, there's a couple different um, flaxseed, like ground flaxseed or things could be beneficial. Uh, they might want to experiment if they're having some gut issues with that. Uh, whether it's a fourth macronutrient, I guess could be debated, but fiber passes relatively uh, undigested through the small intestine and enters the colon where it's fermented to short chain fatty acids, 
like butyrate, and then butyrate becomes the preferred fuel for the colonocyte. So, uh, so you have, it becomes, uh, it not only nourishes and provides fuel for uh, expanding favorable gut microbiota in most cases, uh, but it can be, uh, the short chain fatty acids are uh, the best fuel for the colonocytes. And if they're deprived of that fuel, that could decrease uh, the health of the gut, perhaps increase intestinal permeability and make us susceptible to, uh, to different diseases. I think it does not have to be a lot of fiber. Like, I guess there's some evidence too. some of the earliest nutrition books that I studied, like in, in, uh, college when I, you know, studied nutrition was basically saying that early man was eight, like sometimes a hundred to 200 grams of fiber a day, <laughs> depending upon the geographical location. So I was under the impression that fiber was like essential and absolutely sort of important. So that was like my educational background. So, but when I gravitated more towards low carb diets and seeing people thrive off diets that were completely devoid of fiber, like carnivore diets that I question that. And, um, but I still think it's, it's difficult to question the massive amount of epidemiological data we have on the benefits of fiber. It's super interesting to me in particular, because I, I also gravitated in, in the past few years towards a, you know, what I currently eat is likely a high protein, moderate fat, low carb, uh, diet. And that's, that's where I'm starting to, to feel like the most sustainability. And the one element that I had really cut back on was fiber. And it did have some consequences for me in digestive health. I was just not feeling great every day with the super high protein without the, the fiber. And so recently as an experiment, I've, I've started eating whole psyllium husk, uh, a lot, like 15 grams in the morning. It's not the powdered like metamucil. This is, this is like large, almost bran flakes. And I mix that into, um, a yogurt bowl in the morning with, with actually some protein in there. So it's a, it's a huge protein bolus. It's also a large amount of fiber. Um, at least, you know, a lot of folks would not be eating that much in a single sitting. And then I also add a, a few chia seeds in there and some blueberries. And so the old, overall fiber content is really high. And, um, so I, first of all, delicious, uh, super satiating. Um, and, uh, I tolerate it really, really well. The fascinating thing is that after making that change, which I did to, to try to see if I would, you know, feel more satiated and, and improve digestion, I saw a 24% reduction in ApoB in my next, um, in my next blood panel checkup with the levels lab. And that was super surprising to me. I did some, some searching around and I found several references to this, um, specifically psyllium husk as a supplement for cholesterol lowering, but in combination therapies, for example, with statins, where people were showing 15% benefit over just a statin monotherapy if they add psyllium husk. And then just on as a standalone, like this is actually an effect that seems to be somewhat consistent. So you had mentioned this um, before we started talking about fiber as you know, the, the correlation with lipids is, is really interesting to me. And I'd love to hear, you know, as we're kind of ending this one, um, do you have a, a fiber related strategy in, in your diet that is related to lipids um, specifically, or, or is it generally digestive or like how, how are you treating fibers in your diet? Well, uh, I am of the opinion because that's, I think you're the fourth person that told me verbally. And then I have a lot of emails too, from people who have introduced psyllium husk and showed me before and after LDL, uh, two people showed me ApoB, which went down like anywhere from one person, 50%, which is it was almost hard to believe, uh, but usually uh, 20%, 25% reduction by adding psyllium husk. Uh, actually, Dr. Mary Newport, we just interviewed her for the Metabolic Link podcast, and uh, she followed up or maybe saw our keto nutrition newsletter on LDL and then followed up with an email that she, there's a particular supplement that I looked into garden of life fiber supplement or whatever but i think it's like you know you can get it on amazon and it has like psyllium is like the main ingredient maybe four or five other uh and then that cut significantly cut her ldl and apob so i don't want to introduce large amounts of fiber now because i'm doing this azetamide experiment but my off ramp i guess if you will to uh, i do not want to use you know pharmacotherapy to manage my, my lipids. I'd rather not. Uh, that's why I'm kind of microdosing it now, but what I'm going to do is get off of it and see what happens and then reintroduce, uh, fiber, probably be psyllium husk and maybe two or other 
two or three other sources of fiber and probably do that maybe with meals, especially meals that maybe have contained, since I know I'm a hyper absorber, higher amounts of uh, cholesterol and transition to that uh, over time. And I think that's an important message for people who maybe have elevated LDL and ApoB and want to do something about it without necessarily having to resort to azetamide or statin, which most doctors, I know even my primary care doctor was like, very, very adamant that I needed to get on something. So uh, I was very resistant to that. And I was like, well, I want to try azetamide as, as a standalone therapy, as a monotherapy. It's usually combined with a statin. And that had a tremendous decrease in knocking, you know, my ApoB. But I think uh, people could take, which is a more feasible approach, a dietary approach, this fiber approach would be a great way to experiment and try to keep all other variables consistent and do that and would love to, could be like a little mini experiment, right? With the, uh, with the levels <laughs> group. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, certainly excited. I've been tracking macros prior to making that, um, that fiber change. And so, so really excited to, to sort of follow the trend over time in ApoB specifically, um, triglycerides, other, other sort of lipid carb fiber oriented biomarkers, um, uh, uh, over time and just seeing how that, that ratio change, um, Lasts, you know, and, and whether this is something sustainable or if that was just kind of a temporary acute response of some kind. So, um, yeah, super interesting to, to, you know, to see tangibly in that blood work for me, the impact of really changing one major element, uh, adding in fiber, which I, I certainly don't rely on as an energetic component and, um, otherwise wouldn't have done if not for just this, uh, this experiment with digestion. So, uh, so with that, why don't we move into a really interesting and, and, uh, you know, I think wide ranging topic, which is fat as a macronutrient. And, and I'd love to hear, you know, your intro on is fat an essential macronutrient? What, what makes it such an important component of our diet? Fat is absolutely essential and we should not try to, you know, go on a zero fat diet as I think people maybe in the eighties did or nineties or whatever. When I was, when I was in school, there was a lot of talk about super low fat, um, it's probably a good idea to reduce omega-6 fats, but I think it's absolutely okay. There's a lot of discussion about seed oils and omega-6, and I think it's absolutely okay to get it, your omega-6 from whole food sources and to try to get ample amounts of omega-3 fats. Not everybody likes fish, uh, but I think if you're not eating fish, then you might want to think about supplementing uh, docosohexanoic acid, a DHA or EPA and get a good you know uh, source for that. Nordic Naturals is a good one I've used in the past, but I you know I may recommend it to my wife because she doesn't eat as much fish. But because I eat so much fish, I've taken a number of different tests, lipidomics tests, omega quant tests, and things. You know, uh, Rhonda Patrick had recommended, and I followed up with, uh, and I eat so many sardines and mackerel and stuff. So so there's no need to supplement. I think fats if you're not. Um, you know, if, if you are eating fish, uh, the fat with protein and carbs will reduce your insulin, uh, and glucose spikes. And also omega threes can lower your triglycerides. Omega three fats can, uh, improve your HDL, maybe lower your LDL. There's a little bit of debate about that. Uh, if you know, you're eating too much fat, especially on a low carb diet, if your trigs, if your triglycerides start to become elevated, and I've seen this before and encourage people to get a genetic test. And sometimes people have like uh, SNPs for fatty acid oxidation disorders or cert certain fatty acid oxidation enzymes. So this is an area that I become kind of interested in uh, just people that are intolerant to these high fat diets <laughs> for one reason or another, another, they're just not, they don't have that metabolic flexibility, which sometimes you, you do see. Uh, but generally speaking, you have, Saturated fat, which as mentioned in really high amounts, and this many people will probably debate this could decrease the sensitivity of the LDL receptor, and that could cause LDL to go up. It can also, there's some evidence that it could increase the production of ApoB. So you have saturated fats that you probably want to make like 20% or less of the total fat consumption. Your biggest uh, contributor to your fat should probably be monounsaturated fats or MUFAs. So oleic acid, um, you know, oleic acid, I think is the main component in like an egg yolk. And then you have monounsaturated fats or PUFAs. 
And then you have trans fats, which are most widely seen, you know, in processed foods, although uh, companies are phasing them out. Uh, not, not all of them though. Um, so that's, that you have the spectrum of fat there, but I think it's important to have at least probably 20% of our macronutrient profile as fat, just because of the satiating effects it has, the glucose moderating effects, and also to ensure that you're getting the essential fatty acids you need. And that could be, uh, with, with omega sixes, that's linoleic, uh, Omega-6 would be linoleic and omega-3 would be alpha linolenic uh, acid, but you want to get them ideal. The omega-3 is ideally cut from um, animal sources. So fish would be, uh, although you could get the alpha linolenic from plant-based sources if you are a vegetarian, like uh, algae and spirulina, I think, you know, have some, and you have just need the enzyme to convert it, convert it over. So all these sub uh, sources of, of fats, do you consider those individual macronutrients or are, are those micronutrients or how do you characterize or categorize the different sources of fat within the, the overall category of fat as a macro? Yeah, that's a good topic because uh, people in the world of ketogenic diets really paid no attention to the <laughs> the the fatty acid composition of the the fat content in the meal. So there was a, like a lot of dairy based, you know, just drink, you know, uh, heavy cream and kind of fill the gap. Uh, but to, generally speaking, if you're getting some animal, you know, protein, you're getting a lot of the essential fats that you need. Omega three fats are probably the most researched. There's an enormous amount of literature on DHA and EPA on PubMed and big, you know, large, randomized controlled trials, uh, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, uh, showing the benefits of omega-3s. Uh, much, many of the bigger studies basically uh, did research on omega-3s from food sources. But more in the last 10 years or so, there's been supplemental, you know, uh, evidence that supplemental omega-3s can be, but, it, but I'm of the opinion to get it from whole food sources whenever possible. So omega-3s have drug-like properties on decreasing inflammatory pathways, uh, brain injury, repair, brain function. Um, I chaired the, uh, the American Epilepsy Society, uh, the special interest group, the, that's called the SIG, the special interest group in dietary therapies in Washington, DC one year. And we had a speaker just talk about omega threes on epilepsy and simply doing nothing, but, you know, amp, you know, increasing omega three content can have an anti-seizure effect and neuroprotective effect. So there are people that are looking at these, uh, fatty acids because they have drug like properties, uh, on many signaling pathways, inflammatory pathways, uh, changing the neuropharmacology of the brain, even in ways. And we know that the ketogenic diet too can change neurotransmitter systems, uh, then you have an interesting class of, of fats that I've always been interested in is medium chain triglycerides. So these are like the primarily the eight and 10 carbon. And when you consume those, they go directly to the liver via hepatic portal circulation, and they're not packaged in the chylomicrons like the long chain fats um, and delivered to adipose. So they go directly to the liver via hepatic portal circulation and they stimulate uh, beta oxidation of fatty acids, they stimulate fat oxidation in the liver and uh, generate an ample amount of acetyl-CoA and that condenses to acetoacetate um, and to beta hydroxybutyrate. So medium chain triglycerides can be consumed and they can stimulate ketogenesis independent of carbohydrate restriction. So about, and it's some studies showing about 20% of the MCT that you consume get con uh, converted to uh, ketone bodies, which then spill into circulation and then can provide energy to the brain. There was a drug, uh, a couple, you know, years ago called AC1202. And that drug was essentially caprylic triglyceride, which is an eight carbon fatty acid. And <laughs> Dave Asprey has it as brain octane. <laughs> and then you can get it, you know, cheaper at the store, uh, as a mix of C8 to C10. So, uh, What's interesting about fatty acids uh, or medium chain fats is that they can also cross the blood brain barrier. So long chain fats can't, they need to be converted to ketones to provide energy to the brain, but these medium chain fatty acids can cross into the blood brain barrier 
and actually be used by neurons uh, as a source of energy. An example of an example of an MCT would be like coconut oil. Coconut oil has like maybe 10 or 20 percent of the composition. A big part of coconut oil is the 14 carbon lauric acid. But uh, if if you buy MCT oil off the shelf, I mean, you can get it in Walmart, CVS, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, it, purified MCT oil is about 60% C8 and about 40% C10. So that would be caprylic triglyceride, also known as octanoic acid, and then capric triglyceride. Or yeah, capric would be decanoic, can break down to decanoic triglycerides. So, uh, so these uh, are very unique uh, fats in that they are they're digested completely different. Uh, and they, like I said, they're not, uh, they can enter circulation as MCTs, uh, medium chain fatty acids, and, um, and then they can convert to the ketone bodies. And then they can also cross the blood brain barrier. So they have, they're very different than long chain fats and they become an intense area of investigation by people who study Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but also there's the MCT ketogenic diet where you could use a more liberal form of a low carb a diet, a ketogenic diet, and then make it ketogenic by formulating the fat composition of the diet with more MCTs. Amazing because there's, there's so much depth again, inside just this one, you know, category we call, we call fats. Um, and, you know, I think that goes to this, this point of, but by starting to pay attention to macronutrients, we are also able to pay attention. Um, just even just using regular nutrition labeling, we're able to see some of the categorization of the fat profile in, in a food. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious to hear, although, although the nutrition labeling today doesn't necessarily go into the medium or long chain triglycerides that are present in the, in, in the dietary source, um, you know, you, you've laid out here, some of the reasons someone would go and seek out whole food sources of these, um, of these differing, uh, fats, tons of really fascinating elements here, low inflammation, super energy dense. So, so fat has nine, uh, calories per gram, where the other two primary macros have four. So more than twice as energy dense per, per unit mass, which is really interesting. And our bodies preferentially um, store energy as fat, as opposed to as glycogen, uh, likely for this reason. Um, what are, despite all of these upsides, all these benefits, what are some of the potential downsides of overconsumption and or potentially sp specific consumption of the various fats. So for example, I think one of the major topics is what's the correlation between fat consumption and heart disease? Do some fats straight up just contribute only to atherosclerosis? Are there some fats that do not at all contribute to, to atherosclerosis? Curious there. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, at the high level, like excess fat consumption in the form of MCTs or even omega threes will have a laxative effect and you have a limited capacity to absorb them at the level of the gut. So they can cause, you know, uh, a lot of gut issues. So, and, and even irritation with MCT. So they need to be added. You can build the tolerance over time to consume, uh, and absorb more of these. Um, I think the monounsaturated fats, uh, have been given sort of like the green light as something that we could, should consume more of, and a higher percentage of our fat composition should be monounsaturated fats versus saturated fats. Although the saturated fat uh, uh, consumption has been called into question by people like Nina Teicholz and, uh, you know, there's a whole, a number of legitimate people, not just uh, scientific investigative journalists, <laughs> a number of people who study uh, lipidomics and, and dietary fat that kind of feel that saturated fat definitely got demonized. Uh, there is some evidence to demonstrate that in the context of excess saturated fat, as mentioned, that was the driver for LDL, but there's equally convincing evidence to show that it's just kind of like total fat really could be the driver for LDL. I'm of the opinion that, you know, I think it's very context dependent. I think, I do think that some people, and this, you know, this is why you need to measure biomarkers. Some people are susceptible to saturated fat induced elevations of LDL and ApoB. And the only way to determine that is to actually do the measurements. And then you have people like, uh, 
Nick Norwitz that, I mean, his LDL and he's not ashamed to admit it is like, you know, four or 500 or something like that. And ApoB, I think in the 200s. And, and he went on a diet that was like completely devoid of saturated fat, just monounsaturated and, and PUFAs and could dramatically increase his LDL independent of like with a little or no saturated fat or very low consumption. So, but he fits in a, in a unique category called the lean mass hyper responder where his triglycerides are very low, like in the forties, HDL is double his triglycerides and his LDL is astronomically high. And we have not seen this. It's not sort of even in the literature until like the last five years or so. So this is an area of intense investigation, but in, in that context, saturated fat does not seem to be the driver for LDL. It just seems to be, if you are adapted to a high fat diet, then there's evidence supporting the lipid energy model that the lipoproteins are trafficking, uh, the fat and cholesterol more or less for peripheral tissues, uh, to, to traffic energy. So that's an area of ongoing and intense investigation. Uh, so more to be discovered there, but I, but I do think for the large majority of, of people that saturated fat could be a, a, a contributor to elevated ApoB and LDL. And then that's a lever that you can pull and adjusting the ratios of your fat intake to improve your lipid profile. Excellent. Yeah. So we, we talked about one of the, one of the major biomarkers would be triglycerides, another April lipoprotein B, which is not a very common uh, triglycerides show up on almost every blood panel you'll get. ApoB, not so much. Um, do you prefer to, to monitor ApoB or total cholesterol or, L, cholesterol or LDL specifically when you're adjusting your fat intake? They correlate pretty tightly with me uh, for, for the most part. You know, if, if LDL goes up, ApoB tends to follow it. Um, so I think it's important to track both to give, you know, to, to have a firm understanding of how your dietary pattern and your uh, macronutrient composition is influencing it because I do believe in some people uh, that are susceptible, you know, that could be problematic. So, so I think it's important to, um, to track macros just for the understanding of really how do we decrease our atherogenic risk and, and, you know, an astronomically high ApoB LDL, if you jump on a low carb diet may not be problematic in the short term, but what happens if you have that profile for decades? You know, uh, my belief is that if you have really good metabolic health in general, it may be negligible, uh, which a lot of cardiologists would, you know, vitriolically <laughs> attack me if I've put that out there. So I don't put that out there, but, uh, but I, I kind of think that there's been a, an, an, over fast fascination with LDL and ApoB because we have drugs that can lower it. We, uh, it's amenable to a lot of pharmacological manipulation. So it, it tends to get a lot of attention, but I do think that if all other biomarkers are in great shape, I think that, that it's far, far less of a concern. However, if you're the average person just wanting to improve metabolic health and a large majority of your biomarkers are not like your triglycerides, your HDL is low, uh, you know, your insulin might be elevated, uh, that, and those biomarkers that are not optimal, especially in the context of elevated LDL is problematic. And, uh, and I think only under unique scenarios would in elevated LDL and ApoB, uh, only in uni unique scenarios, would it be less of a concern or perhaps even not a concern at all. If you kind of believe some of the recent data that's coming out on lean mass hyperresponders showing, comparing that data, Dave Feldman and Nick Norwitz and uh, the Citizen Science Foundation is actually spearheading uh, work comparing this to the Miami heart study data, cohort of data. So, and it's very interesting. And, uh, you know, I could let Dave and, and Nick kind of talk about that, <laughs> but um uh, so that, that's probably of all the things, you know, most hotly debated, and even from a research perspective, one of the most intense areas of debate and investigation with low carb diets and ketogenic diets is the atherogenic risk that the elevation of LDL and ApoB uh, present. And there's the large majority of people think it's something that is of concern that needs to be addressed pharmacologically. But as you observe, and that we discussed, I think simply adding fiber, I mean, there's a lot of self-experimentation that people can do. 
uh, with different sources of fiber and then, you know, adjusting carbohydrate consumption, you know, to, to, to optimize that. What would I would want to double click on there for everyone listening is just that despite the evidence or correlations between lipid intake and atherogenic um, outcomes or atherosclerosis and heart disease. Uh, so th there, there's likely a link there. The epidemiology shows that, but, but there are also very strong relationships between just general metabolic health and those same outcomes independent of lipid profile. So it is, um, you know, ApoB, for example, oftentimes described as uh, necessary, but insufficient to cause a heart attack, for example. There are other reasons that we could be in really, you know, uh, you know, in, in an exposed condition. And it's important for us to pay attention to general metabolic health and, and be considering all the big picture together. And macronutrient tracking is a really powerful way to get a, a head start on that, to be able to take our existing profile, any biomarkers that are sitting way outside of range, and then compare that against the macronutrient intake, the real macronutrient intake that we're providing to our bodies to, to try to discern what, what is driving this. Um, so let, let's uh, dive into maybe the, as a, as a wrap up here, some of the ways that macronutrient tracking tools can, can really uh, make this real, realistic for everyday people. Um, do you track your macros every day today? I don't track every day because my diet is so routine and boring. I eat like essentially the same meals. Uh, sometimes I'm trying to lose weight or gain weight. And the way I do that is decrease or increase egg, the number of eggs in the morning. So I do know exactly what the macronutrient composition is because I track, but then, and then I, uh, I know the composition of all the different meals that I eat and which, you know, in the levels app, you just pop them in there and you can just pull them up on the day. So my, I would have like six meals in there. And, uh, but, but I do think it's absolutely essential for people just starting out. So I do it from time to time too, as I, as I adjust my diet, but it's not something that I do all the time. So when you're going to be making a change, experimenting with a new protocol of some kind, you'll, you'll track again to enter that data, see, see what the outcomes look like. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, uh, I'll, I'll track it and then like event mark that. And then I'll have, you know, my blood work and biomarkers that I can refer to, to see, you know, to timestamp that and to see how that caused a favorable or unfavorable change in, in the biomarkers. Yeah. Aspirationally would love to be at that level of, uh, of lifestyle dial in. I, uh, I eat a few meals very consistently that, that breakfast bowl I have every single day, like clockwork, but you know, things tend to get sort of, they vary day to day in terms of lunch, snacks and, and dinner. And so it's been really powerful for me to have, I think for two reasons. Firstly, I've become really interested in through experiments like the psyllium husk one, just the power that individual macronutrients have over like very significant biomarkers like my ApoB, which I am trying to modulate. So the, the connection for me has been an accountability I think mechanism actually more than anything else is that I'm, I'm really enjoying through this, this new feature set that we have the easy macro entry. So we have, you know, artificial intelligence. I basically just dictate, um, verbatim a sentence. Like I'll, I'll say fajita salad, uh, sliced chicken, sour cream, guacamole over lettuce and press the button and it enters it and it breaks it out into the macronutrient complete ingredients. And that's, so that's really straightforward, but then What's more interesting to me than that, because that's the chore, is seeing the relationship between that and my goals. So I, I've set a protein goal for myself. You know, we talked today about trying to hit a pound or a gram per pound of body weight. That is my current goal. And I'm trying to actually gain weight and put on muscle mass. So I have to eat more, more than my current body weight, which is about 170 uh, grams per day is my target. And um, it is amazing when you think that you're hitting that for months prior and are not putting on the mass that you expect to then start actually tracking this closely and realize, oh, I was actually, you know, 50% short on, on a lot of days that I just was doing this math and magic in my head and assuming that I, oh yeah, I got it in here and there. And when you really start entering these, so that, so that accountability layer of, um, with our, with the macros feature, and then with our habit loops, which basically allow us to set a protein target, a, a fiber target, and for me, a workout target every single day. And I can kind of close the rings almost like you're, you know, your step counting in your Apple watch that has been so motivating for me to, to just stick with this consistently. And it's, I think the most important thing is just being able to keep the burden really low. So it's not, I don't have to take minutes out of my day. It's, it's seconds. Um, 
I think I, what I wanted to talk about from there is, is really the evolution from, from here to the next phase, which is we talked a lot about how macronutrients impact biomarkers. And, you know, what I, what I think is maybe lacking in the world of macronutrient tracking today is an opinion. You know, people will download these apps, they'll start to enter the, the foods they're eating on a daily basis. And it's like, once, well, once you've done that a few times, there, there's nothing really, where's the value return? You know, there, it, it's really just, does the scale change? Do I, do I gain or lose weight the way I'm trying to? What I envision for the next wave is really understanding at a much more sort of biological level, how are these macronutrients impacting you? And is your body giving you an opinion on whether you're doing you know, the right thing or should you be adjusting macros? And that comes down to biomarker tracking, CGM data, being able to close the loop with uh, insights and s- sort of scoring or features to, to provide feedback, not just on carbohydrates, but then also through our biomarker or metabolic labs panels on your you know, macronutrient impact on triglycerides, on ApoB, on uric acid, on fasting insulin. So love to hear from you, you know, what, what would it uh, look like for you in the future? What, what is the ultimate, um, in your mind, metabolic health tracking system? What, what should it do to give people insight into whether or not they're properly uh, consuming food on a daily basis? And, you know, what, do you see the, a future where people actually keep track of their biomarkers and their macronutrients in a consistent way day to day? I would love to have easy access to like my macros, you know, when I was in high school or in college and things, you know, and I did track it sometimes here and there, just like on paper, but having the, the ease of accessibility to have this through the AI generated system, the barcode scanning, things like that. And to have that essentially, you know, in the app timestamp with other biomarkers that people can measure with, um, with the other features of the app uh, is going to be invaluable, especially if they're trying and everybody's trying, I was going to say, especially for people trying to make changes, but everybody's trying to improve and, and make uh, adjustments. Most people are trying to lose weight and improve body composition. So just to have that history there and something to refer to as you tweak and make adjustments along the way uh, to your training too, if you amp up your training, preparing for something, whether it be uh powerlifting event or a sport event or a marathon or something like that, it's going to be really important to, uh, you'll be leaps and bounds, you know, ahead of everybody else. (laughs) If you nail down your nutrition and, and, you know, measuring is one way, uh, and monitoring these other biomarkers is one way, not only to improve your metabolic health, but also your performance and body composition is going to be sort of important. And, and for, um, uh, many people who reach out to me to manage whether it be age-related dementia or type two diabetes, and I know levels is not uh, a tool for clinical management, but for people who have pre-diabetes or just a history of certain disease processes, this is where you start. You know what I mean? You can invest a little bit now, or you can invest a lot later on, right? <laughs> for the clinical management of that and all the comorbidities that are associated with it. So the time to improve metabolic health is now. Uh, before it becomes a problem later on down the line. So, and having all the, all those features in one app is super important. And maybe, I mean, you asked it like what's on the horizon, you know, multi-metabolite monitoring, you know, is something that'd be cool. It's like lactate and uh, ketones, obviously, you know, maybe uric acid, things like that. And having all that in there uh, is be like super important for like the elite athlete and advanced athlete who really wants to take it to the next level. No pun intended there, but, but I think it's, you know, I I think everybody has something to, uh, to really benefit from, from this technology. And I think it's just all in a one-stop shop, you know, within the app. 